uh, towards the end of the 15th century, Pope Alexander VI decreed that Spain could claim any lands in the New World for itself under the condition that the natives were converted to Christianity. With the prospect of making a fortune and going on a mission, Hernan Cortez decided to make his way to the Americas. After arriving in Cuba from Spain, Cortez was sent out to Mexico to conquer that land, claiming it in the name of the Spanish crown. Cortez's arrival in Mexico in 1519 was very unique. There had been a prophecy in that land among the Aztec people that one of their gods who had gone off at some point would return in a particular year, at a particular time, and that God was described as a white-bearded man. And so when a white-bearded man arrived on their shores, seemingly perfectly matching with the prophecy, time, date, everything, they essentially gave all ruling authority to Cortez and his men. And so Montezuma, the ruler of the Aztec people, handed their fate over to the Spanish invaders who destroyed the ancient city of Tenochtitlan and killed many of the Aztec people, including their leader, and they built on top of it Mexico City. The Aztec people and their leadership believed that this God who was coming and the, those that would come with him, that they were good, that they were coming in fulfillment of prophecy, that they would be good rulers, that they would lead them into peace and lead them into prosperity. Sounds familiar? Sounds like every political ad ever. But this is the condition of the human heart. What we want is comfort, we, we want ease, we, we want prosperity, and we will anoint anyone who promises to give us those things. But is that the right mentality to have as believers? How should we view kings and kingdoms, uh, nations and leaders? And as we've done the last two weeks, we will look at the origins of kings and kingdoms from Scripture. And so our first point, as it has been the last two weeks, is kings then, kings then. And before we get to human kings and kingdoms, we have to first and foremost see that God is king. And so we read in a number of places. Psalm 47, Psalm 10, 16 says, the Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his hand, from his land. King Jehoshaphat in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 20 says, O oh Lord, God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. In your hand is power and might so that none is able to withstand you. Or King Hezekiah in Isaiah 37. O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, enthroned above the cherubim, you are the God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. God is the sovereign ruler of the universe. God is the ultimate king forever and ever over all the earth, over all of creation, over all the created beings. But let's go back to Genesis as we have done previously and look at earthly kings and kingdoms for a moment. Clearly, Adam is set up, is portrayed as a, a king. We talked last week about how he was portrayed as a priest. Well, he's also portrayed as a king. God gives him the commission. 
that he would have dominion, rule, authority over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air and the, the, the animals on the land and the creeping crawlers, uh, creeping creatures uh, around the earth and the seeds and the, the, the plant life for food. Kingship is at the heart of the commission that God gives to Adam. He is granted dominion over all the plant and animal life on the earth. He is told to have many children in order to subdue the earth and have dominion over it. You're hearing repetition of these words, rule, dominion, authority, power, right? Adam is to rule the whole world as a subordinate king under the authority of God who is the true king over all. And Adam is to, to, to spread his dominion outside of the boundaries of the Garden of Eden and extend it all the way around to all of creation. In this sense, God reigns over his creation in and through Adam. But as we know, that's not what happened because Adam uh, failed. He, he fails to take dominion over the earth. Instead, he, he rebels against his own sovereign, the Lord Almighty. And so does God abandon his intention to rule over the earth through a human king? No. In fact, in Deuteronomy, he gives the qualifications for what an earthly king will look like. In chapter 17 of Deuteronomy, he says that the Lord himself will choose the king, that he must be an Israelite, that the king must not rely on the military aid of Egypt. He must guard his heart against idolatry, especially the marrying of foreign women. He must not rely on the power that comes from his wealth. He he must rule according to God's law. But before we get to that point in, in, in the history of the nation of Israel, we, we, we see a kingship role in Abraham. We, we, we look at the call of Abram in Genesis chapter 12, and we see this renewed commitment on God's part to rule over the whole world through his chosen means. But in this mean, it is not through one man, Adam, but through kings who would rule over a great nation. God will bless Abram abundantly and make him through his descendants into a great nation that God will bless so that they in turn can be a blessing to the nations, to the rest of the world, to all the families of the earth. In Genesis chapter 17, verses four through six, the dominion mandate that was originally given to Adam is renewed with Abram, now called Abraham in this passage. Let me read it to you, Genesis 17, four through six. Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. Where Adam was given responsibility to take dominion, Abraham, through the covenant with God, is granted dominion by God. You see the difference? Where Adam was to multiply and subdue the earth, Abraham will be made into a great nation. Because Adam's commission comes before sin has entered the world. There were no obstacles for him to perform his duties. After sin, if dominion over the earth will be possible, it will be a gift from God. So with the Abrahamic promise, the stage is set for Israel's future role. Israel, through its kings is to be a a blessing to the nations of the world and then through God's reigning in Israel, that power and authority of of God's rule and reign was to expand and re-encapsulate the whole world. And we know that when we get to the point when, when, when the kings begin to rule in Israel, 
Israel was in desperate need of a good and a godly leader. And we know that because we've seen this downward spiral of the the nation into sin and rebellion in the book of Judges, where everyone did what was right in their own eyes. That's the theme that keeps repeating through the book of Judges. And things are getting worse and worse and worse. Israel is desperate for leadership. They're desperate for a capable leader. And so the first king comes in the form of King Saul. When the people of Israel, with wrong motivation, said, we we want a king just like all the nations around us. We want to look like them. We want to act like them. And so they ask for a king in 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now, it's always been God's intention to, to create kings Uh, As we read in Deuteronomy 17, this was always going to be the plan. But at that point in in Israel's history, it was that God was their king, but they said, no, we want a king after our own kind. We want a king like the rest of the nations. And so God gives them what they want. He gives them what they want. And he gives them a king that's just like all the other kings of the nations who has no regard and no respect for the Lord. And eventually, he is removed from the throne, leading to David, and David with whom God enters into a covenant and promises to preserve a kingly line into the future, into forever. Now, Israel's history with kings, if you have any uh, knowledge on this subject, it's not good. It's, 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 It's bleak. It's terrible. Why were the Israelite kings such bad managers? They never took in any prophets. (laughs) I spent an embarrassing amount of time (laughs) trying to find a joke about Old Testament kings, and then I ended up writing that one myself. Ah. Every preacher's dream, clapping for the joke that I wrote. I figured, because we had done prophets, prophets, anyway. But think about the history of the nation of Israel. I mean, they are literally, it feels like every other chapter in the Old Testament, they're on the brink of extinction. They keep going in wayward directions and the northern kingdom is sent off into exile and not long after that, a few hundred years later, and the southern kingdom is sent off into exile and you think it's just one king and one failure after another. And what does it remind us of? It reminds us that, that Adam was a failure. And so it's just this line of failure after failure. But God does not cease to be king through all of this history. He he is not finished with Israel even at this point. And he still holds his covenant of a Davidic line, a Davidic king. We are still waiting for, for in Old Testament history, they're, they're still waiting for this dominion over the world and the nations under this one Davidic king. Now, like we did last week, let, let's put ourselves in their situation. Let's think about what this life is like. You, you're, you're looking at king after king after king who, who has failed, who, who has led the people astray, who has married foreign women and brought in foreign gods. They have misled the people with only a few exceptions And they're bringing curses down on their nation, one after the other. It's leading them into exile. What do you think the people were waiting for? When they were picturing waiting for the perfect king, what was it do you think that they were picturing in their minds? This king would probably be a dominant king who who would crush all of their political enemies. It would probably be someone who would bring them peace geographically with the surrounding nations. 
It would be someone that could restore their hope that life can be better than this oppression that we're living under. It it would be for someone that would lead them into prosperity and bring them back to the glory days in every material way. Think about that for a second. Is that not what we want? Is that not what our hearts desire? Well, let's see if their expectations are met. Kings then, and so now we come to the New Testament and we look at kings fulfilled. We, we, we read in the early parts of the New Testament that there's this puppet kingdom that's been set up, the, the, the Herodian dynasty, which are from Idumea, they're, they're descendants of Esau, who, who's not even part of the covenant community. It, it just goes to show what a sham that particular kingdom was. But onto the scene enters one who, who meets all of the criteria of Deuteronomy 17, one who has fulfilled all of the prophecies of of what a king would be. He's in the line of David according to the Davidic covenant. Onto the scene enters the the real king. But he's not born in a palace and he's not born of considerable wealth or great material means. He's not even born with a lot of pomp and ceremony from an earthly perspective. He's born with a lot of pomp and ceremony from a heavenly perspective as the angels come and sing, declaring his praise, singing glory in the highest. He's visited by the Magi who recognize him as a king. Herod is terrified that he will raise up an army against him. But Jesus' life in humility as the son of a carpenter is very far from royalty. It's very far from kingship, what we would say is kingship, what that world at that time would say is kingship. Listen to what the angel Gabriel says to his mother Mary about him, Luke chapter 1, verse 32. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Fast forward now to Jesus's baptism in the river Jordan by John. And we read from Mark chapter one, verse 11, that the, that the, the spirit descends on him like a dove and The voice of God speaks from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. This is fulfillment of Psalm 2, verses 6 and 7, which says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today, I have begotten you. But where specifically do we see Christ as king in the New Testament? Well, there's, it's upside down. It's an upside down view of things. Just as his birth wasn't received as you would expect a king's birth announcement to be received, let alone the cosmic king, his life pretty much follows a similar path. He does receive some kingly treatment during his ministry, meager as that may be. They're the two accounts of the women anointing his feet. You have Mary of Bethany who uses expensive perfume and then the the sinful woman who uses her tears to anoint his feet, both showing a a right recognition of his anointing, something reserved for priests and kings. It it, it wasn't happening on a large scale. It it was only happening in ones and twos in the hearts of a a few chosen people whom the Holy Spirit would reveal just a, a, a snippet of his kingship of who Jesus was. And then we have Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, fulfilling another prophecy from Zechariah. 
and the people are so excited that they may have their new king if he is the Messiah. And then he will rule over his people. This is the expectation that, that, that he will overthrow the, the authorities who constrain them as a nation. And, and in this case, it's Rome, the Roman authorities. And where did they get this notion? Your enemies will be made a footstool. He, he will rule with an iron scepter. He will dash the nations. That's the rest of Psalm 2. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. And why did they focus on these prophecies and not the prophecies that said he will be humble, he will suffer, his people will reject him? It's because they wanted something so bad that they would do anything to get it. Esau wanted a pot of stew so bad that he sold his birthright to get it. David wanted Bathsheba so badly that he was willing to kill a man for her. Peter wanted to protect his own safety so badly that he was willing to deny Jesus for it. On a non-biblical scale, I remember running for class president in elementary school and I would do anything to get it, including spreading lies about the other candidates, which showed that I had a great future in real politics. <laughs> Think with me for a minute. What are the things in your life that you are so desperate for that you would do anything to have it? Is it love? Is it peace? Is it prosperity or wealth? What is it? What is it that has so captured your heart? The Jews in this day, what did they want they wanted the nation to rise up and wipe out the pagan nations. They wanted power, control. They wanted supremacy. They wanted to live their lives not under the oppression of another. And is that what Jesus gave them? No. World history shows that people, by and large, have mostly lived under some form of oppression. The Jews are under the Roman authority. The Christians will be under that same Roman authority. The early church was under constant persecution. Then Constantine shows up, converts to Christianity. There's a brief period of peace. And then you have the rise of Islam. Look at Western Europe. Kingdoms come and go. Even the Catholic Church is set up as a, as a kingdom and begins to abuse its power and authority until you have the Reformation. And then after the Reformation, you have the Enlightenment and the Renaissance, where, which are really kingdoms of the mind. Then you have nations set up, and nations rise, and nations fall, and they go to war, and there's oppression and domination, and the effects of Adam are everywhere. So what happened? Where is the kingdom of God? Where is the king who fulfilled the office of king? When Jesus described his kingdom, what did he say to Pilate? My kingdom is not of this world. And how true that is. Because the Romans will mock him as a king and they will place a crown on his head, but it will be a crown of thorns. And they will put a purple robe on him, but it will be to mock him. And there will be a sign hanging above his cross, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. And the people will call out to him, you who said you would destroy the temple and in three days rebuild it, save yourself and come down. So where is it? Where is the kingdom? Where is the king? 
Beloved, it's the same kingdom we read about in the beginning. In Psalm 103, verse 19, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. It's not a kingdom that conquers land the way nations do. It's a kingdom that has always ruled over all. We don't make Christ anything. He rules over all. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Listen, listen. We cannot read kingdom language through the grid of American Christian nationalism, nor can we read kingdom language through the grid of moralistic social gospel. It is not as if Christ is gaining or losing power or authority in this world. He has established his throne. His kingdom rules over all. His kingship is therefore to be seen as his official power to rule all things in heaven and on earth for the glory of God and for the execution of God's purpose of salvation. If Christ is not ruling in this capacity, then we have to ask the question, who is in control? Who is holding all things together? If you say it's the power of Satan, just go and read Job. Even Satan has to stand and bow before God and ask for things. He he doesn't have this authority to hold all things together. We think of Christ's kingly rule today in terms of his kingdom of power and his kingdom of grace. It's not that we are waiting for him to take the role of king and then begin his ruling power. It is that he does it now. He is in full control and he is ordering all of human history as he sees fit. This means that at his ascension, which funny enough, the disciples said, Lord, at this hour, are you now going to restore everything to the nation of Israel? And Jesus says, no, I'm pouring out my spirit. Now go out and be disciple makers. But, but this means that at his ascension, Christ rises to the right hand of the Father, and even now he rules over all of creation, the kingdom of power, and over all of his church, the kingdom of grace. Now, I understand that this doctrine can be confusing, so let me break it down for us so we can uh, digest it in smaller bites. Why do we say that there are two kingdoms? Because Christ is head and rules the church, his bride, his body, we, his people. In fact, that's the rest of the quotation that we have from Colossians chapter one for the very next line after we stopped was, he is the head of the body, the church but he also rules the world, all of creation. Let me start with the kingdom of grace. His rule is a spiritual rule. As Louis Burkhoff puts it, it is established in the hearts and the lives of the believers. Some people were entering into the kingdom yesterday when the word went forth and people departed from the kingdom of darkness and were brought into the kingdom of light. Christ's rule over this kingdom is based on his redemptive work. No one is a citizen of this kingdom by their humanity. Only the redeemed have that honor and privilege. It is a spiritual kingdom, so it has no flag. It has no world headquarters. It has no P.O. box. But it is certainly and powerfully present when Christ's people gather to hear the word of God proclaimed and to receive the sacraments. Paul in Romans chapter 14 says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy 
in the Holy Spirit. We must be careful not to confuse the kingdom of God with our cultural, our economic, and our political institutions. As Jesus said in John chapter 18, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. It is the reign of Christ in the lives of his believers and His church is a global church, which fulfills God's promise to Abraham that the nations would be brought in, that that, that Abraham's descendants would be almost without number. That's the kingdom of grace. Secondly, the kingdom of power. The kingdom of power, on the other hand, This refers to Christ's rule or dominion over all of creation. In this case, as creator of all, he is also Lord. He orders the affairs of nations. He controls through his, by his sovereign hand, the lives of individuals. Quite simply, the scripture puts it this way. Psalm 115. Our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. This serves as the basis for understanding all of history as ultimately serving the purpose of the redemption of God's people. Since we know that God is working together everything after the purpose of his will, Ephesians 1.11 and that he is ordering all things so that human history is racing to a great and final climax, the return of the Lord to the earth for the resurrection and the final judgment. It is this kingly rule of Christ, the the kingdom of power, that gives us comfort in the midst of turmoil. It gives us comfort in the midst of the signs of the ends of the age. So whether it be natural disaster, disease, wars, rumors of wars, it it gives us comfort no matter the geopolitical situation. Listen, I do not care who the president of the United States of America is as long as I know that Jesus is king. I I don't care who the governor is as long as I know that Jesus is king on an international scale. I don't care who the prime ministers, the presidents, the kings, the queens are because I know that Jesus is king and that is all that matters. So stop living as if Jesus is not the king of the church and the king of this world. Live your lives, rather, as ambassadors, as as messengers of reconciliation because he has reconciled us. For, beloved, if anyone asks you why you are acting differently, being unmoved by the things of this world, being confident in what you do, you tell them, I worship the prophet who reveals, the priest who reconciles, the king who reigns. Long ago, at many times, and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also, he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high having become as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray.